I've entitled the message for tonight, The Greater David and Goliath. I was trying to think of what would be the most well-known story in the Old Testament, and I don't know if it would be this one, but it may be. This story has very much been secularized. Uh, the term uh, David and Goliath is a sports metaphor. It's used for the um, uh, insignificant person taking on the uh, man. You know, the, uh, it's used in that light. Uh, against all odds, the underdog taking on the favorite, David versus Goliath. We're getting ready in a couple of months for March Madness, and we'll hear that quite a bit when the 16 seed takes on the number one seed, David versus Goliath. Now, I want you to look at the verses I just read once again, and this is the key to understanding this story. Let me remind you, every story in the Old Testament is given to illustrate the gospel. That's so. Verse 8, this is Goliath. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and you servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. Now, only two men will fight. You see the gospel there, don't you? Only two men will fight, not Israel against the Philistines, but David versus Goliath. If David wins, all of Israel wins. He didn't have any help. He fought by himself. If he wins, all of Israel wins. If he loses, all of Israel loses. And the key word in that passage of Scripture is found in verse 9, if he be able, there's the key, if he be able, is Christ able to defeat sin and save his people? That's the issue, his ability. Now, David has not yet come onto the scene uh, when we read this passage of Scripture, but I believe he's one of the greatest types of Christ in all the Word of God. Uh, he's prophesied in 1 Samuel 13. Would you turn there? This is after Saul has been rejected for presuming to offer an offering. Only a priest could do that, and he thought he could do it, and he's rejected by God because of that. If you come into God's presence or attempt to come into God's presence apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be rejected too. There's only one way into God's presence, Christ alone. Now here uh, we read of this first prophecy with regard to David. And I can't find the verse. <laughs> um, oh, here it is, verse 14. But now, the, but now thy kingdom shall not continue, the Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded. Now here we have David prophesied. After Saul's been rejected, David is prophesied. Look in the last part of chapter 15, verse 34. This is after... Saul failed to kill the Amalekites, and we're going to consider that next time when we consider Samuel. Then Samuel went to Ramoth, and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul into the day of his death. 
Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he'd made Saul king over Israel. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Now who was born in Bethlehem? That's the home of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Samuel said, How can I go if Saul here to kill me? And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I'm come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. Now, of this you can be sure. Jesse had no idea that David was going to be the one that God called. All of his other sons were brought there, but not David. Verse 6, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked upon Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. We know it's not him. (laughs) He didn't even bother to bring him. Behold, he keeps the sheep. (laughs) A shepherd. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send him and fetch him, for we will not sit down until he come hither. And he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance. And goodly to look on. And the Lord said, Arise, and anoint him, for this is he. Now what a description we have of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ruddy. That's where the word Adam comes from. The second Adam. The Lord Jesus Christ. And I love the way it's pointed out that he was beautiful countenance. The beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wish I could describe his beauty the way he ought to be described. But this represents his attributes. His holiness. His absolute sovereignty. Beloved, you're in his hand right now. He can do with you whatever he's pleased to do. He controls everything. That's who he is. His absolute justice. All sin must be punished. He's all powerful. Whatever he wills, he has the power to cause it to come to pass. His independence. He has no needs. Oh, the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love this uh, phrase that he's goodly to look upon. Looking unto Jesus. Is there anything better than that? To be enabled to look upon him and know that you're complete in him. Know you need nothing else. His beauty. You you see his beauty as your savior. Now that's the description of David. He's ruddy of beautiful countenance and goodly to look upon. And that's what faith is, is looking upon him. Now look in verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit of God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with the hand and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well. 
and bring him to me. And they answered and one of the servants and said, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing. Now, once again, what a description of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be troubled. Oh, he's cunning in speaking peace to the troubled soul. But not only is he cunning in playing, he's a mighty, valiant man and a man of war, a mighty conqueror. Prudent in matters or prudent in words. He said, the words that I speak unto you, their spirit and their life. And the Lord, a comely person, a beautiful person, and I love this, the Lord's with him. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now all this took place literally without question. It's an actual historical event, but what a beautiful sight we're given of the Lord Jesus Christ from this passage of scripture. Verse 1 of chapter 17. Now David has not come into this story yet. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. And were gathered together at Shokoth, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shokoth and Azekah and Ephestabim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on one side of the mountain and Israel stood on the other side. And there was a valley between them. Now picture this in your mind. Israel's army. The Philistines' army on top of a mountain and a valley between them. Verse 4, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass upon his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And a spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Now, Goliath represents my sin. Anywhere between 9 and 11 feet tall, depending upon how long a cubit is. There's different views. I remember one time when I was a little boy, um, there was a man that was eight foot two that came to Gateway, a grocery store, and he was called the Gateway Giant. And I can remember seeing him eight foot two. And he had a robe on with a crown, and I remember his shoes were size 22. Um, eight foot two, biggest man I've ever seen, but he was so frail looking. And I remember thinking he seemed so unhappy. But that's not the way this giant was. He was at least nine feet tall. His armor weighed 180 pounds. That gives you some idea of the strength of this man. He had a spear that was 26 feet long. That's how long a weaver's beam was. And his spearhead weighed 20 pounds. Now, this was a formidable man, and Israel was scared to death when they saw this man. I mean, think of how strong he was, where he would wear 180 pounds of armor. This wasn't like the gateway giant. This was a giant, Goliath of Gath. Verse 8 and 9, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and you servants to Saul? Choose you a man from you. And let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. God has only dealt. Now you listen to me. God has only dealt with two men. The first Adam and the second Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all 
die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. Now you think about that statement. In Adam all die. What Adam did, he did as a representative. When he died, me and you died. When he sinned, me and you sinned. Somebody says, I didn't sin. I wasn't even alive then. When he sinned, you sinned. In Adam, all die. He's the representative man. When he sinned, you and I sinned. When he died, you and I died. In Adam, how many die? All die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, not everybody's in Christ. Only the elect are in Christ. Only those that Jesus Christ died for are in him. But in Christ, everybody he represented in Christ, just like everybody Adam represented died, everybody Christ represents lives. Two men to fight this battle. Verse 12. Now David comes in. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went out and followed Saul in the battle. And their names of the three sons were Eliab, the firstborn, the next Abinadab, and the third Shema. And David was the youngest and the Three eldest followed Saul, and David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep. I think it's interesting how David is pointed out over and over again as a shepherd, even in this passage. Does that ring a bell? A shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. Most people think David probably composed Psalm 23 when he was a teenager watching the sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for thou art with me. He was a shepherd. Look in verse 22 of the same chapter. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage. And ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. He left his carriage and uh, with the responsibility of this man to watch his sheep. Look in verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride, the naughtiness of thy heart. For thou come down... That thou mayest see the battle. Look at the way his brother slams him. Those few sheep you're watching. Look in verse 34. And David said unto Saul, Thy servants kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard and I smote him and slew him. <laughs> well, don't you love that? Picture this in your mind. A lion comes out. He gets one of his sheep. He, he grabs him by the beard and smites him. Kills him. A bear attacks him. He kills him with his bare hands. He was supernaturally enabled to defeat any enemy. Goliath's easy for him. If he can kill a lion, if he can kill a bear, Goliath doesn't have a chance against him because he's supernaturally enabled to fight like this. He was a shepherd. Now verse 12, or verse 14, And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Verse 16, And the Philistine, this is Goliath, drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. That's how many days the Lord was tempted in the wilderness. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah for this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their hosts and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Now Saul and 
all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper. Oh, he was always faithful with the sheep. And took and went as Jesse had commanded him and came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. There they stood for 40 days. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name. And the armies of the Philistines spake according to the same words, and David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that's come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it should be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. That's a sermon, isn't it? The achievements of the Lord Jesus Christ and that which he does for his people, making them free and giving them to him. Verse 26, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Look at his courage. He wasn't afraid. Why, he'd rip that lion to pieces. He'd rip that bear to pieces. This giant was no match for him. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be to the man that killeth him. Now his brother, huh? you know, this was David's oldest brother, and I'm sure he looked down on David. And look at the way he talks to him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left these few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? The glory of God? Is there not a cause? His brother was accusing of a duplicity of motive. But is there not a cause? And our Lord Jesus Christ, is there not a cause? The glory of my Father, the salvation of my people. And he turned from him toward another, verse 30, and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, King Saul. And he sent for him. He heard about this young man who said he was, uh, who's defying Israel like this. Uh, bring him to me. And Saul heard this. Verse 32, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him for you, but a youth. And he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. He was encouraged by this. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. Saul, do you think he needs this? He just ripped a lion apart. He ripped a bear apart. Do you think he needs your armor? The answer is absolutely not. This makes me think of the methods of human religion to help bring about salvation. They're not wanted and they're not needed. All that's needed is God the Holy Spirit blessing the preaching of the gospel. Now look what it says in verse 39, David girded his sword upon his armor. He essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said, and so I cannot go with these, 
for I've not proved them. And David put them off of him. And he took his staff in his hand, that shepherd's staff, and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now, five, he selected five smooth stones. Now, there's a reason the number five was selected. Uh, A.W. Pink wrote a book on numerology in the scripture, and he pointed out that every number is significant. And five has been said to be the number of grace. And that's because the way it's used in the tabernacle. The size of the courtyard, the height, the width of the tabernacle are all multiples of five. There are five curtains that cover the tabernacle. There are five ingredients to the um, incense that they made, the, whole, uh, the oil, uh, the Burnt, the altar was five by five cubits, perfect five square. Um, five, there were five different offerings in the scripture. So you can see where this could be the number of grace. And this is what came to my mind when I thought about this. And I don't know whether the five has anything to do with this, but I like to think it does. In the great chain of salvation, there are five links. Whom he did for no one. Then he also did predestinate, number two, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Three, whom he called, them he also justified. Four, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now there's the great chain of salvation. Begins with God's foreknowledge, and that doesn't mean he just knew, uh, he's a time traveler and knew what was going to happen beforehand. Whom he did foreknow. This is talking about his love. Behold, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Those persons he loved, he predestinated for them to be just like Christ. Everybody he predestinates, he calls with irresistible grace. Whom he calls, he justifies. He makes it to where I'm sinless before God. And whom he called, justified them, he also glorified. Now he puts these five stones in this shepherd's bag with a sling. And I love to think of this sling as a type of the preaching of the gospel. He, he takes that sling and he slings that stone divine omnipotence directs it where it's supposed to go and it hits the giant in the head and kills him. That's the preaching of the gospel. The stones of his grace being directed by irresistible power into the place where God would have it be. So he has his five stones, stones of grace and a sling. He doesn't need a sword. He doesn't need a spear. He needs nothing like that. Let's go on reading verse 41, and the, Philistine, and the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. Now think about this man. I don't know how much he weighed, but his armor weighed 180 pounds. He must have weighed five, 600 pounds, solid muscle, a 26-foot uh, spear. Uh, he wasn't afraid of David. When he saw this young man coming out of him, he was offended. You bring this man out against me? Do you think he can fight with me? And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. He's a pretty boy. There's nothing to, there's nothing to him. He can't defeat me. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't know it yet, but that's, you're no different than that. Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. 
but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, and I'll give the carcass of will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And here's why I'm doing all this. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Now don't you love to think of David doing this? One man. And oh, he was so confident. He wasn't afraid of this man. Why? Because he had the name of the Lord behind him. The name of the Lord is who he is. The name of the Lord is his attributes. That's the name upon which we call. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We call upon his holiness, his sovereignty, his justice, his righteousness, his grace. He's coming in the name of the Lord. That's who he is. Goliath's no match for him. His sword and his spear is no match for him. For him, and I love the way he says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. This day. Now, this is a reference to the day of salvation. I know it happened on that calendar day when that took place, but the Lord lived 33 years upon the earth. But salvation was accomplished in a day, the day of his death. Now, he had to live those 33 years and live out that perfect righteousness and keep God's law perfectly. But what if he would have done that and went back to heaven? What good that would that do us? None at all. This is the day of salvation. The day the Lord hath made. This day shall the Lord deliver you into my hands. And that is exactly what took place with the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says on that day, having, listen to the scripture, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Next time somebody asks you if you've made your peace with God, say no. Christ made my peace with God. He made my peace. And this is how complete this victory is because of the blood of his cross Every believer, according to Colossians 1, is holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in the very sight of God. This day, salvation in a day, the day of God, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that scripture. Who is he that can condemn? Bring it on. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died on that very day. Yea, rather that's risen. That's the only answer I need. It's Christ that died. It wasn't Todd that died. It was Christ that died. Oh, the power, the glory, the sufficiency of his death to put away all sins. Yea, rather that's risen again. Who's even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us. Being now justified by his blood. Now let me remind you. David didn't have any help here. You know, even that uh, Philistine, he had his armor bearer going out with him. He tried to have some help. Not David. When he had by himself, Hebrews 1.3, when he had by himself, with no help from you, no contribution from you, there's nothing you did in this great work of salvation, when he had by himself purged, our sins he sat down his work was finished verse 47 and this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into notice our hands now David did this alone, but he doesn't say to Goliath, he'll give you into my hands. He'll give you into our hands. You see, what the Lord Jesus did, it was for a big group called our. The same ones who are enabled to pray, our Father 
who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. He's talking about the elect. Everything he did, he did for every single one of his people. He didn't do it like, he did it by himself, but he did it for his people. Verse 48, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Don't you love to picture this in your mind? This shepherd boy, that giant with his armor, and David with nothing but the sling, just running at him, right the, that sling, getting ready to let it go. And like I said, I think that's such a beautiful picture of the preaching of the gospel when God directs the stone into the place he has ordained. David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone stunk into, sunk into his forehead. Evidently, it crashed right through the skull, went into his brain, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there's no sword in David's hand. See, all that's needed is the preaching of the gospel. Nothing else is needed. What, what, uh, what do you all have to, to attract people? The preaching of the gospel. Nothing else? Don't want anything else. It's all worthless. The only thing that counts is the preaching of the gospel under the power of the Holy Spirit. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, you're putting too much emphasis on the preacher. I'm not putting any emphasis on the preacher. I'm putting emphasis on the message that he preaches, the gospel of God. <clears throat> Verse 51, therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and he took a sword, the Philistine's instrument of death, and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled and now here's where the men of Israel come in after the victory has already been won. This is me and you. And the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they came to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And they wounded the Philistines and fell down by the way to Sharon, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. Oh, the spoils. Justification. Redemption, regeneration, preservation, calling. Oh, the spoils that our great David accomplished for us that we just take. No battle on our part. He won the battle for us. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. And he put his armor in his tent. Now, that's a thrilling story, no doubt. But if I don't see the gospel in this story, two men fought. If David wins, all of Israel wins. They get the complete victory. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ won. And everything he achieved by his death Every believer possesses. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for our greater David, David's Lord and David's son, and how we thank you for the salvation that he accomplished. Lord, in Christ's name, we ask that you take this word and bless it according to your will and give each of us faith in the greater David. Give us the gift of faith that we might trust him who alone won the victory and gives us the spoils. Bless this message for Christ's sake. In his name we pray.